Hello, welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, you can send questions and comments to the Facebook chat. So good evening to all watching on Facebook as well as the chat running alongside this YouTube video. So hello and good evening if you're watching us live. If you're not, you can feel like you're watching us live by watching the chat replay. So welcome to all of you. You know me, I'm John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. And we have a skeleton crew tonight, but strong but sturdy. Here we go over to Juan Sepulveda. Good evening, Juan. Good evening, John. Brothers, have uh thank you so much for being with us tonight once i put with a here from orange blossom lodge number 80 in sunny kissimmee florida and the brother behind the whining stairs freemasonry podcast good to see you good to see you and last but not least the robert johnson hello uh hello. robert johnson <laughs> bassmaster waukegan sitting secretary over at space novum and uh, host of whence game you podcast Thanks, John. Okay, great. And as a reminder, definitely want to thank all of the patrons who supported the show for the past year. Um, We really appreciate all the support you've done and continue to do, and that keeps us going. In fact, uh, we had had to work out some tech issues, but uh, we got those all fixed thanks to you guys. So um, that's why you're awesome. And if you want to be part of the Awesome Club, head on over to patreon.com slash the Masonic Roundtable and you can uh, chip in a little bit to help keep this Masonic education free and going for some time. So thanks again. Tonight's episode is going to be kind of the beginning of a two or three parter. Um, We had heard that some of Masonic thought and philosophy was influenced by this concept of Platonism and Neoplatonism. So uh, tonight we're going to specifically start with what is Platonism and does it have any impact, uh, influence, uh, or what kind of the, the thought process behind Platonism and its philosophy as it can be um, addressed and assumed and considered in the Masonic thought. Um, so we've all kind of done some independent research and we're all just going to pull our ideas together. Um, you know, we, we are not students of philosophy. We are not, um, you know, we don't have a degree in philosophy, but uh, it's certainly a passion project. And I think You'll get some great insights out of out of tonight's conversation. Um, so let's start off talking about Platonism in the sense of this guy named Plato, right? <laughs> this is where Platonism comes from. It's the philosophy of Plato. So uh, who wants to talk about who Plato was? Just the time frame and kind of set the stage. Uh, yes, you with the gray shirt on. Is it me? Is it me? <laughs> Uh, all right, so I was pretty heavy into into philosophy as a, as a student, uh, both in high school and in college. But um, I would say that Plato is a lot of people always run to Socrates, and maybe that's because Bill and Ted's uh, Adventures did Socrates. that, right? Socrates, party on, dudes. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, so, so Plato is a student of Socrates. Socrates writes like almost nothing. Plato right. writes everything. Plato creates this school. Um, what is it? Like around 380 BCE or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, the school rides for 300 plus years before uh, it gets shut down by the Romans. Uh, Plato had some extravagant ideas, and he's a great writer in that um, you see the evolution of thought through his writing. So he's changed as he got older and more refined. And then, of course, it's important to understand, too, that while we're talking about Plato and Platonism tonight, there may be some brothers listening who think, oh, they didn't talk about this, this, and this, and we're intentionally going to... Um, diverge from talking about topics related to Neoplatonism, which is, of course, where we draw the line in the sand from a philosophy versus the mysticism that later is attributed to it into a religion. In fact, today, if you go research, 
pushing Platonism. Unless you're like in a college course or you get on academia or you're reading about um, Christian uh, theosophy or not just not theosophy, but Christian um, theology, philosophers, mm -hmm. theology. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, you. You don't actually get a whole lot of Platonism. Uh, you get Platonism as it's uh, interpreted by Christianity right. or Over, somehow yeah, 2000 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so Platonism in itself is, is I think, kind of where Plato landed. Um, uh, it, it, I also I would be um, not doing my job if I didn't say that uh, almost all of the things that Plato wrote, he wrote fictional dialogues where the centralized character was Socrates. It was his BFF. His teacher. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was his homage to his teacher. Um, and so that's important. And I said, fictional narratives, and I mean, fictional, all of them. Fictional as in the characters and events or fictional as the concepts and ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. So mm -hmm. I'll have people that are, are people that argue with me, but I'll say fictional, um, fictional dialogues. So whether that's Critias, mm -hmm. Timaeus. Or the never finished uh, third part to that, mm -hmm. um, but fascinating uh, individual in an, in an end of himself. The the first guy who really asked us to not just just to yeah. know yourself. Yeah, think different, right? Um, now yeah, I'm... don't don't. What, what does it say? What was the Greek term? Is is it doxa? D oh, D right. it's, it's like D O X A. It's it's basically going along. It's the public opinion. You just you just travel along through. Don't don't ever think for yourself. Just cruise through. <laughs> right, which he um, thought was a mistake. Now, one of the the core tenets of Platonic thought is this thing called the theory of forms, and I've I, I've got a lot of research on that. But I didn't know Juan if you wanted to do anything else to set up based on your research what you've uh, heard and read about uh, Platonism. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll segue on your comment about the, the philosophy of forms. He, he did, I think, a great job at illustrating his concept with um, the allegory of the, of the cave. In where <laughs> Absolutely. He, he's, talking, he's talking about the, the forms being pretty much how what we see, what we are able to perceive with our senses which he had a different idea of what the senses were. Uh, the, what we perceive with the senses is just a, as a represent, representation. It's just the surface of what really is. So there is a, a profundity to everything that we encounter that for most people, they can go their whole life experiencing it and believing it to be the absolute truth and not questioning the, the deeper the deeper connections that it may have mm -hmm. with things that they their their senses cannot perceive and we have talked in the past about the allegory of the cave but just for the for the sake of those who perhaps haven't listened to that episode or, or watched it in the allegory of the cave you have these individuals who basically spent their life knowing nothing more than the shadows formed in the wall of a cave so it's almost as if they have their backs turned to the real world, but they live only looking at the wall. Now behind them, there is either a fire or a source of light, and there are projections or shadows. Think of shadow puppets created by those, by those who want them to, to believe. So because these people live in that isolation, only perceiving those shadows on the wall, that's what they consider reality. But in this particular story one of those individuals is able to wonder outside thank you uh if you're listening on the podcast right now john has on the video form put an illustration this is one of the best illustrations i've seen other than i like it yeah <laughs> um so he he talks about the individual breaking free from that confine of perception and venturing out into the real world and 
seeing reality for the first time. Now, that's not where the whole story ends. This individual, after seeing the light, mm -hmm. uh, not the light, but the, the real life on the outside, he could come back into the cave and attempt to convince the individuals in there that there is more to what they can see with their senses. And some of these people may choose to remain the rest of their lives at the mercy of whatever illustrations they're able to see in the cave wall, as opposed to trying, at least trying, to follow this man's advice into the expanse, in expansive universe he has discovered, basically. So we're still talking about non-observant masons or what? <laughs> Lol. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to feed the trolls, but no. But it's a great but allegory. It, it is, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and it, it works with so many different things. It can work with religion. It can work with um, metaphysics, Change strength management. theory. <clears throat> right. Exactly. It, every, <clears throat> everything you can, you can think of. Yeah. So, so that's in, in that's a great use of the or a great illustration of what he considered the philosophy of the forms. Right. So this didn't actually yeah. exist. It's an allegory. I would like to continue. Just I want to back up a little bit because forms really is the basis and the height of of Plato um, in terms of of what he's really known for and what drives at. Mm -hmm the part that connects to masonry. Right. And so if I could just back up to set you up a little bit, John, for forms would be to also, when we're talking about thinking, um, he's talking about um, concepts. And the and so in to, to on your way to forms, as, as we'll talk, as John is going to talk about, uh, there are concepts and there's the thing. So we have abstract concepts and then the thing, right? So if you, a popular example would be to say, um, is it three? Three is a concept. It's an abstract concept. But if I have three bourbons on the table, that's an actual, can, that's the that's the real, right? It's the tangible piece. Three oh, we have to, we have to. Yeah, exactly. Cheers, fellas. <laughs> so, so, or, or a popular example um, would be a football. The, the game of football is abstract. An actual football match is is the thing. So, as we're thinking about mm -hmm. that stuff, uh, there's there's another uh, story that was told that allows us to think about. Uh, moving into the realm of being able to think, which is what the Academy really taught amongst other things. And it said like, okay, you get on a sailboat and you set sail. This is journey part one. The second journey starts when you take the sails down and you go where you can't plan on going. And that is like the real world takes you so far before you have to close off and let it go where it goes, like the free thought form so that you can tackle these abstract ideas. Like you don't know where you're going to go. You're an open ocean, open territory now with, with no guide. It's just your mind. And right. so there's this element of where is divinity going to push you? Mm -hmm. Well, and so that's a good setup. Um, because remember who his teacher was. His teacher was Socrates, who introduced the so Socratic method of questioning, right? At, you know, unpacking. Don't, don't go to the definitive. Go and open the space. Create space to say, well, what are there other options? What else could, could there be? How else could we solve this problem? <clears throat> and so that Socratic line of, of questioning can help get us out of the concrete and into the abstract. Anything else you want to say, Robert, on that? Before I transition? No, I, I just wanted yeah. to make sure that folks knew where we were coming from when we, mm -hmm. when we move into the abstract space. Yeah, because it gets, it gets harder to see physically because that's, that's the whole point is that 
previous to this platonic thought of the ideal of forms, <clears throat> that the, the counterpoint to that, what was going on, was naturalism. That I can, as Robert said, I can count and see three things, so that's all that can exist. And when you start to, you know, today we take it for granted when we think of like, oh yeah, there's, there's a number called infinity that can go on forever, <laughs> or there are irrational numbers that go, at, go on forever. Um, these are abstract concepts that would have been very foreign <clears throat> um, for people to understand in that time frame. Um, I'm going to pivot a little Imperial bit. Imperial equilibrium <clears throat> does not exist. <laughs> there's, there's no scientific equal. There's, like, scientifically, there's equal, but there's no empirical equal. It's right. an abstract concept. Yes. Yeah. It's just, that's, that's getting pretty heavy. That's getting pretty meta, right? Um, one, one way that I'd like to um, kind of translate this, that, that school of thought, how foreign that is, is I um, heard a story about some uh, combat, um, military uh, combat veterans who came back from uh, working on an overseas operation. And... Uh, the culture was there that when they were in this this local town, they actually had some uh, some maps drawn, you know, from a bird's eye view, and they were asking the locals, uh, especially the the seniors in the town, like, which house is, is this person in? <clears throat> and the the guy was like, try, he could not understand this concept of of this map, and so they were trying to explain it to him. They said, okay. Um, imagine you're a bird looking down on your city. Like here's your house here, here's your house there. And to which the, uh, the senior in the town said, but I'm not a bird. It doesn't make sense. What do you mean? I can't, I can't, I'm not a bird. So I can't, I can't picture that. Um, and so that it wasn't a language barrier. It was an abstraction barrier that happened there. And so in, in the platonic time period, uh, the, the natural state was the was the rule of law. He introduced this concept of abstract ideas, and so what what are these ideas that he was saying? That basically, in the theory of forms, everything has a form. We have a form of what an apple should be or should look like. We have a theory of you know what love is. We have a theory of what a good a good marriage looks like. And so, what what he posited was that this idea that we can all kind of agree on. Um, exists in a separate plane of existence from the natural external world and also separate from your internal consciousness. Um, because there are some things that like, okay, you could say as a toddler, you get taught, oh, that's, this is what an apple looks like. And you just learn, I see a red round thing with a stem, probably an apple. And so there are some things that are taught, but then he's arguing that there are even some things that are innate, that are some part of, of human consciousness that exists outside of physical time and space. Um, and then there are characteristics of it. So as a, as a coder, when I was researching this, I was thinking like object-oriented programming and class systems, right? You can have a class of apples. So, um, so if you're talking about the, the ideal form of a perfect apple, right? You can have a class of apple that are green apples, that are honeycrisp apples, that are uh, moldy apples, that are half-eaten apples. We as humans can determine, you separate them all um, but we all have a, a foundation point to relate back to. We know it's an apple because it has these characteristics. Um, and so what he argues is that there is a, a perfection point. There is, there is a perf uh, perfect ideal form for everything. And all we do is we experience life in relation to that. Um, that, you know, how, how is my marriage not quite hitting the ideal marriage that I'm picturing in my mind? How, you know, how is this apple different from the perfect apple? Um, which then, uh, which even goes into not just nouns, but characteristics. Uh, so redness, things that are red. Um, you would not say that um, a, a red stone is the same as red fabric, red wool, but they have the same quality, characteristic of redness. Whatever this perfect red state is, it has a quality of that. Um, some philosophers argued like, well, why are we debating over the perfect state, right? We'll never get there. So it's just an exercise of futility. And his counterpoint to that was, well, no, we need to know what perfection looks like. So we can not only baseline where we are, but also continue to get closer to that. Robert? 
Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, one of the re ways that he taught forms was he actually, to kind of tie this in the masonry, and, and I'm not stretching, this is a literal thing that he likened this to, was to teach the idea of forms was a, a stone mason. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, would he would have um, the master's cube, the master's like mold or like a wooden structure that would be used to put around a stone. And so that was the form, mm -hmm. the guide form, right? And so he said, if if the if there's there has to be a form for each thing because when somebody started talking when I started first looking about learning about forms, you know, uh, Deb Maher, thank you very much, uh, one of my old college professors. You know, she's talking to me about forms and she said, "No, you don't get it," because I'm thinking like I'm thinking about psychology and I'm thinking about archetypes and she's like, "No, no, 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 no," literally a form. And I said, well, "Why doesn't he just say?" <laughs> the perfect man. Why doesn't he just say the perfect whatever? And so the genius really in lies in Plato a little bit when he used the term form, right? Because it doesn't imply, um, like by using the word form, you don't have this immediate psychological break. Oh, not even going to try for it. It's the form. It's form the, mm -hmm. the form of, you talked about the perfect marriage, which was interesting because for, for Plato, the perfect marriage was really weird, like pretty foreign concept. But I think many people who have a successful marriage do this anyway. Uh, you you should strive to be with somebody that makes you better. Right. Like exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. That's, so that's you want to be with form. someone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah, continue. Sorry. I digress. <laughs> no, that, that's, that fits pretty perfectly where I was going. Um, and so, okay, so if we, we're trying to understand this likeness, this, this perfection, this abstract concept as we base our entire reality around, um, there's a quote out of the Republic where the, the, the mentor and the mentee are having a conversation, and, it's a, and the mentor says, well, what about someone who believes in beautiful things but doesn't believe in the beautiful itself and isn't able to follow anyone who could lead him to the knowledge of it? Don't you think he is living in a dream rather than a wakened state? Isn't this dreaming? whether asleep or awake, to think that the likeness is not a likeness, but rather the thing itself that it is like. So when I read that, that the concept, what that... that Unpack it. Me, Unpack yeah, it. <laughs> what, what that says to me is, okay, let's just zoom in. Let's zoom in on the last, the last statement. The likeness is not the thing itself. So Masonically, that triggered a phrase that I had heard that let's, let us not confuse the symbol for the thing that it symbolizes. We get so caught up in buying anything, cell phone case that has a square and compasses on it, we lose that there is no such thing as a perfect square and compass. Abstractly, ideally, physically formed, but also the what it represents. And so we're too quick to um, go right to a physical object, a physical symbol, because it's, it's down in a natural state that we can understand instead of really trying to shoot for the ideal form of what that is Masonically. And here's, here's another good example of this. Um, in 1922, there was an artist uh, by the name of um, Rene Magritte, and he painted this abstract uh, piece of artwork that says, in, in, in French, this is not a pipe. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole point of this exercise is, well, yeah, it's a pipe. You painted a pipe. No, 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 no. This is not a pipe. This is a drawing of a pipe. This is, an, this is an abstraction of a pipe. Oh, by the way, this isn't even the letters P-I-P-E. That it wants you to step away from the abstraction, the artist, the art, artwork of a pipe, because it is in and itself is not a pipe. Uh, so it, it's an interesting, this is called the treachery of images, if you want to go look that up. And so I, I found that to be a good example um, in a more modern sense of, well, what do we mean something is not something? Well, it's, there you go, right there. It, it's a picture of a pipe. It's not a pipe. It, it's a representation of. And so um, 
again, that we should not conf confuse the, sim the artwork for the thing it represents. Juan, I, I want to pick work. your brain on... I, I was going to pick your brain on something, but go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I heard... Uh, it's my boy. About what? Oh, McGree, okay. Green. McGree. My question is, is for you, since this is your vocation, you're the master. Um, I've been... Uh, in some of the reading for Platonism, uh, one of the concepts I came across was the idea that um, you could come across a perfect, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use that word, a beautiful sunset uh, painting. And I'll use sunset because everybody loves a sunset, right? It's, it's kind of um, cliche, I suppose. But the same colors used somewhere else on another painting are not beautiful. So mm -hmm. there's this idea that the beauty is in the ether until something forms in the real world that connects to the idea and then, you know, kind of morphs into the thing that, you know, is it the beauty in the eye of the beholder? I, how do you feel? What is this for you? Uh, no, I, I love the question because there, there, there is harmony in color, and there there are colors that behave adequately next to one another, and there are colors that are anathema to to others if you think about it that way. Yet, when you find them in nature or in some good execution in a, in a painting or a work of art or an illustration you you if you're aware of the confines of color theory and the traditional schools of art you may think ah oh, that just shouldn't look good it shouldn't it shouldn't work and yet it, it beauty is not bound by your by your stupid rules <laughs> you know, you're able just as much as nature you as a creator are able to put together things that that shouldn't necessarily go together but when you do them it's like oh wow and i'll give you a perfect example i know there's a dominican brother listening to this who will hear when i say that i take milk and i put orange tang in it and i drink it and i love it his heart warms up and he recognizes that even though common notion the the doxa will say that is disgusting juan how dare you that dominican brother knows that morir soñando is an amazing drink that is served in the dominican republic with milk uh sometimes ice cream oatmeal and orange juice which shouldn't go together because you know what happens to milk when you put a citric, uh, any kind of citric liquid in it, but still. So he, this, this person that's listening, he's able to recognize the beauty of that, even though, the, like, like I said, the doxa would say, oh, that is disgusting, bro. If you're listening to me, if you've never had this, listen carefully. Eight ounces of milk, okay? You take about two tablespoons of orange tang, or preferably if you have real orange juice, about two ounces of orange juice, a spoonful of sugar, which will make the medicine go down. Uh, beat it up real nice and don't delay. Just drink it. Don't wait until it's uh, until it gels and separates or whatever. And you are welcome. Yeah, that's an abstract concept that I haven't fully wrapped my head around yet. So, so <laughs> thank thanks, you, Plato. Thanks, Plato. Here's <laughs> what I heard: I heard uh, toothpaste and orange juice <laughs> with a little bit of sugar. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna go for yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know we're all do gonna it. do it. So, so thanks for that. Andy. Andy says I'm right. <laughs> Andy knows what's up. Andy knows what's up. Um. So okay. So we understand this form of good. We this this ideal forms. And one thing that we have to think about now is so when it, 
translates to ethics. Well, I mean, I'm going to skip ethics for now. Let's just talk about math because there's a whole abstract concept of math, uh, like Robert started off with with three um, earlier. That that spawned a whole like platonic thought of abstraction in math, right? Because you can think of things like uh, two parallel lines that go on for forever and never cross and go on for you know, an infinite amount of time, right? You could never understand that, uh, but that translated to a whole thing of math, which really um, spawned two basic principles of math forms. One, mathematical objects are perfectly real and exist independently from us, and the statements are objectively true or false, and their truth value is similarly independent from us and our methods of evaluating them. And then the second concept is mathematical objects are outside of space and time, right? Because we can imagine them, we can, we can picture them. And by contrast, the principal subject matter of natural science only consists of the physical objects and processes in current space-time. So we have the abstract and the, and the real. Um, but that was, a, that was a huge breakthrough from, from a mathematics perspective. Switching over to ethics now, um, since we have this, this whole ideal form, well, you, it obviously translates up to what is the ideal end state? What's the ideal goal? What's the, the perfection, as it were? And in fact, uh, they had a term for it called um, the eudaimonia, which is um, commonly translated as happiness or welfare. Um, it's, it's flourishing, prosperity, it's uh, fulfillment, that kind of thing. And um, as he was doing some work talking about eudaimonia, um, he talks about the three parts of the soul, and this is where it gets into the Masonic section as well. Uh, the three parts of the soul are reason, spirit, and appetite. And from that, we get the three virtues of wisdom, courage, and moderation. But there's, there's three plus one. There's an extra one that binds all those three together, which goes by the name of justice. Justice! Justice! So, justice... E.G. E.G. Abstract concept, uh, concept of equilibrium. Right. So we have the four cardinal virtues that we're familiar with today, uh, articulated in the, in the name of wisdom, courage, and moderation, with justice binding all three of those. So... You know, you, you Masons who are familiar with those, that is exactly where your four cardinal virtues came from. It was from this platonic thought. Uh, up talking about the, the spirit, the soul, the reason, the spirit, and the appetite. So I think that's pretty neat that it traces all the way back to that. So um, that's what gets me going with when you do Masonic education. I like to find like exactly where this concept came from, right? Not, not who wrote it last in the ritual book. <laughs> But no, really, where did it originate from? What's, what's it really trying to say? And you have to go all the way back to like 3rd century BC before you really can, can find the first recorded written evidence of what that, that abstract concept means of you know, temperance, fortitude, prudence, and justice. There is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> right. No hay nada nuevo bajo el oh. sol. Nothing new under the sun... Except maybe this concept of taking things historically and contextually, how they were written, when they were written. Ha! Huh. That's true. No, no, we have to we have to read it <laughs> in current moderation. Uh, right. No, <laughs> charity means charity, right? Charity means benevolence. Right? No, but I so to tie that back, right? This idea of thinking, which is supposed to be the idea of uh, it, it's. Man, it's really the art of thinking that there's that is proposed um, in this philosophy uh, that brings about anything at all. And so you can trace that now through Renaissance and Enlightenment thought, even into New Age thinking. And then if you look, so the other idea too that, that attaches to Platonism and then Neoplatonism is the idea of like a, a universe as a place that has uh, always existed um, where there are other Middle Eastern religions that would, you know, put a, a linear timeline to the right. start of a universe or something. And what's interesting about that is 
we can tie that to some Kabbalistic ideas in the terms of like, what is the, what's the form of the man? It's the, the perfect man. Is it the Adam, right? The Adam Kedmon, Kedmon, uh, you, we, we see all the time, you know, in, in some of that kind of thinking. Um, but it's just really interesting to see how that particular idea and that way of thinking about abstract thoughts and having a, a third party uh, version of yourself out there somewhere uh, that helps. It's, it's just, it, this is why um, we were talking about doing this, this episode on Platonism. And John said, it's hardy. I'm like, yeah. It is hearty. <laughs> it's got a lot of meat to it. It's meaty. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to to mention one thing that this reminds me of and kind of tying it back to, to art. You have these ideals in art in, in regards to form, not in the the form that Plato talks about, but the, the actual form, like the figure. And you have perfect proportions and you have specific proportions that in by by people are considered to be beautiful and i have a book that i just gave to my kids i've had this book for a good i want to say close to 30 years and it's a it's a book on on cartoons on doing caricature and his last the last name of the author is redmond and his approach to teaching people how to draw a, a body and how to make a caricature or make an illustration of an individual is to visualize that perfect man, even if it doesn't exist, even if those perfect proportions don't exist, even if you find that perfect man that the nose measures the same as the width of his eye and the, the his eyes are perfectly in the center of his head. Most people draw the, the eyes of people up here they spend the whole lifetime looking, your eyes are in the middle of your head. You measure and your eyes are pretty close to the middle. Anyway, uh, so he gives those proportions, but you never actually draw people like that. And what makes a person look like they have a big nose is because it differs from that archetypal nose or that perfect nose in, in, in context. But it is a good measure for one to be able to visualize that form in an effort to recognize what it is that makes a person special. I know whether your head is pointy or it's round or whether your eyes are too close together or too far apart because I know that perfect proportion without necessarily ever seeing it. It's just a concept, right? And the other thing that I don't... I don't know if I dozed off and I didn't hear you equate it to it, but when we talked about the challenge that Plato would face about what's the point of actually pursuing this perfection if, if it will never be attained, like where's the benefit of that? Like that directly reminds me of the perfect Ashler. Like we are imperfect Ashlers through and through. The, the hope is that as we work in our life to perfect, perfect ourselves, remove the superfluities and then check our angles and do all the necessary measurement to make sure that we fit for that celestial lodge above, that perfection does, is not achieved here. But that doesn't mean it's not valuable. I have this concept of this afterlife that I wanna be a part of and my perfection in this life is what makes me a better man every day. So there is value in it, even if I can't attain it at the moment. I mean, which goes to something that you and I are big fans of, Juan, about Kaizen, right? Just being a little bit better every day, right? We're never going to get there to perfection, but that's it. The goal is the journey, not the end state. And so as long as you can keep striving for perfection, uh, knowing that you'll never get there, uh, the, the wisdom comes from what you improve on incrementally. Uh, so to really kind of wrap things up, uh, we wanna, just wanted to transition to say that uh, Plato um, did establish this uh, academy, he called it, where um, he, he formed this school based off his thought 
in the third century BC, which went on to uh, about uh, the three centuries AD as well. So you had a school that was going on um, for you know 500, 600 years. And uh, w- what's interesting is that obviously he didn't live that long, so this lineage had to keep being passed through. Um, but like any good system, uh, you get a new teacher and the things change over time. So the academy had like three phases where you had um, what they called the, the old academy, the middle academy, and then finally the, the third or the last um, academy where, uh, or the new academy. And the new academy is when Neoplatonism takes over. And that's really what, what segues into to next week's episode. Um, but there was a period of about four, 300, 400 years of schools of thought where um, we started with uh, this concept of Socratic thinking, right? Uh, what they called philosophical skeptic- skepticism, where you should challenge your thoughts, you should challenge these concepts, really ex- explore them <clears throat> abstractly. And um, just from a timeline, a philosophy perspective, uh, we've talked, we've had a whole episode on Stoicism. So Stoicism doesn't plug into this until about 90 BC, so right up into the middle, uh, middle academy time frame, where we're starting to be in, influenced by what Marcus Aurelius and a couple others um, introducing the Stoic philosophy, which which interweaves into this Platonic uh, academy. Uh, but um, that's when they start to reject skepticism and then um, go into this what we call middle Platonism phase. Um, also, uh, for people who are familiar with the um, uh, the, the Christian historian Origen. Origen actually attended the academy during the middle uh, middle Platonism phase. So Origen was absolutely influenced um, by middle Platonic thought, which then influenced his writings. So when you look at the exegesis he does of Christian text and informs some of the <clears throat> Christian theology that then informs you know, a whole series of thought leaders of Christianity down, down the pike. Um, a lot of it comes down to um, the influence of Platonic thought in the Platonic school known as the Academy. So I think that was, that's kind of a neat <clears throat> uh, jumping off point, right? That this is where this started. And then, you know, we'll talk about Neoplatonism uh, next week where we actually see even more influence into um, Christian thought and then, uh, our Masonic influence as well. So that's that's the journey arc that we're on right now. As we wrap things up, anything else that you guys want to share before we start uh, closing things out for tonight? I did wanted to to point out the the phrase uh, noche. Let me see if I pronounce that right. Noche te ipsum, which is know thyself, and it's it, it said that it was inscribed in the 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 temple of apollo in delphi but that plato actually shined a light on the importance of it is for you to know yourself and in spanish if you if you think of the word conocer the the root word comes from noche from an n-o-s-c-h i mean n-o-s-c-e so conocete is noche te basically it's know yourself and it's incredibly important in in our profession if you think about the importance of being able to be introspective about where you are in your development process be familiar with yourself more than you are with anything else and you'll give yourself an opportunity to be that perfect actually you you seek to be well couldn't have ended it on a better note there so so thank you for for tying that all together, Juan. Um, so let's uh, go over to Robert for Seamus Plugs and final thoughts as we take Platonism home for the week. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Um, sp- specifically thinking about, you know, it's it's a whole thing to talk about a concept that's based on abstract concepts that are composed by abstract thoughts of people who aren't you. (laughs) Uh, So it's just really interesting. One of the things that you mentioned earlier when you kind of made this transition into mathematics and you talked about 
abstract concepts like zero. And um, we have to measure things by what are tangible, right? Werner Heisenberg, if you guys are familiar, um, Nobel Prize winner for physics, 1930s, 32, maybe 38, 32, I think. Anyway, um, he said something along the lines of, we can only measure the unknown, I'm paraphrasing, you can only measure the unknown uh, in the context of what is known. So um, when we're thinking about abstract concepts, it's so imperative to think outside the box, to think in the open waters, as it were, right? Because there's nothing that's coming as a discovery without uninfluenced thought or trying to get to uninfluenced thought in a way. Um, so yeah, just really appreciate it. Um, thanks for everybody for watching. And, uh, if you are around on Sunday nights, nine 30 syndicated forever. <laughs> Wins came you. Thanks. Good stuff. Thanks, Robert. Over to you Juan, for shameless plugs, final thoughts, platonic thoughts, hopefully. I love it. I love the, I love the discussion. Thank you so much brothers for your research and, and, and your words. I, I love hearing your perspectives on, on, on these things. And we are very celosos or jealous. It doesn't quite translate equally jealous about the, the lessons that are in, in the craft, but the more you study other philosophies, other cultures, you recognize that the, the, we share so many things from different schools of thought and, it is we should have that that passion for that for that knowledge that that search for light should never be limited just to what's available in a masonic book or a masonic uh a masonic building we are we have so many facets to our life and to restrict our learning just to what a few authors within the last 200 years had to write it, it seems to me to be a short-sighted way to to build your own temple. So I encourage brothers to indulge in in all these different research. Look at you know pull on these threads. If you found something tonight that you found interesting that you want to learn a little bit more about, obviously try that uh, morir soñando orange drink that I talked to you about, or miss out. It's on you. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I encourage you if, if, if you, if the, the sayings of Plato or all these different things, pull on those threads because they'll take you deeper into knowing yourself better. Thank you as always for making the Masonic Roundtable a part of your Masonic journey. Thank you for all of those who kindly uh, donated to in the Super Chats. We have uh, Melly Holmes and Brother Nathan Tweedy being very generous in, in supporting our work. We greatly appreciate that. And if you want to uh, support the different efforts that I have on Masonic aspects and helping men become better, I encourage you to go out to thewindingstairs.com where I continue to offer the Strong Foundation course for those who may have a little bit more time in their hands during this pandemic. Stay safe. See you next week. All right. Thanks, Juan. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy kind of digging into this this uh, nerdy stuff because it's I always learn something new. I always get a new wrinkle in the brain, and uh, that's that's enjoyable uh, because it uncovers a little truth about you know ourselves every, every time I learn something like this. Um, and so, you know, my advice, like Juan said, is to go if something is kind of curious about something we said tonight. Go research it. Don't be scared by the 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 really um, heady. Uh, philosophy websites and stuff that are out there try to find something like a udacity course or an edX course or a couple of good youtube videos to to dive deeper um, but don't let it scare you because uh, it can get it can get very abstract very quickly um but uh but keep on keep on digging through and you'll find some little nuggets of wisdom uh that you can start to apply into your daily life and that's why we do what we do we we like not only just figuring out what what all this means but then the so what? How do we how do we apply this? So hopefully you gain some Masonic translations and how you can see how that fits into our ritual, and that um, next week we'll we'll dive even deeper into the neo 
new platonic thought and how that applies to to Freemasonry. So um, with that, I want to thank you all very much for watching. Be safe, wash your hands, and keep searching for more light. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.